So my first game. I haven't heard that before. Uh, Naked, that's a good Against him yeah. with DC9 in 2011. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming on the field. And I'm already nervous because he's my favorite player of all time, you know. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, we'll go out, we'll do the 11s, and then, you know, the guy, they do the anthem, and then they come shake. So he gets to me. And I, I don't even know what my face looks like. And he grabs me and he's like, hey, I'm very proud of you. Like, keep fighting. Wow. It's an, it's it's uh, inspirational. Like, and I was just like, <gasps> How do I play this? Yeah. <laughs> and then after we changed jerseys, and I was like, I could retire today. Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS Studios in Midtown Manhattan. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Susanna Collins, David Goss, Charlie Davies. What's up, crew? Flex on them, Charlie. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not as good as it used to be, but no, it's, it it's probably, you know, two hours next to second other, best Charlie. at this table. <laughs> I feel like they're similar. Go 1v1 in you don't want to uh, see my gun show. See, y'all. that's how I know you're going to lose. You're a soccer player. It's one on one. I forgot that you two were God, you're setting this so up. That's going to make it even worse when you lose. You're we have a big a show coming up. If, if we do this, we'll actually tape it and you can enjoy it <laughs> along with all of us who will certainly Don't be there come. for the clash. Uh, Matt Jordan, the GM of the Houston Dynamo, is going to join us here in a little bit because Wilmer Cabrera is the fourth MLS head coach let go this season. He was terminated uh, on Tuesday. Mike Pecky, as you know, was on Monday officially. We talked about that on the last show. Uh, we have a reason to talk about Freddie Warra. I was up the top, though. This is the best. The interim coach for RSL, and Sam Stachel told you, perhaps could get the head coaching job. He adopted the RSL cap, the one that made the run on the field. Is it the one that made the run on the field? I don't think it's the one that made it's the run on the field. It's not the same well, they're, they're friends, though. But they're, they're, yes. They are friends. They're yes. friends. They're in the they same might be location. siblings. Maybe they're siblings. Yeah. How many cats are at RSL? Uh, cats, ducks, all sorts of, you know. Wildlife. Yes. It's like a, a zoo. I it thought is it was right on the side cougar of the mountain. <laughs> uh, that's so too. It is a cougar. That's probably why there's cats in the stadium. They're hiding. Ah, Safe okay. space. Good. I mean, I'm, like a, during a time of such like coaching strife, yeah. this is such a feel good moment. I know. Moment. Are you guys cat people? makes me happy. Who's I, cat people? I just, sure? I'm an animal person okay. in general. Dave, I know, is not a cat not, person. Yeah. Not big on domesticated pets. Okay. Yeah. My first pet was a cat. Tippy. Tippy. But I'm, nice. I'm a converted dog person. <laughs> I would say I'm a converted dog person, too. Mr. Marbles going head-to-head with Tippy for best friend. Oh, Cameron's not a dog, by the way. Good point. Okay. Just making Just sure you're aware of your I'll, situation. I'll make oh sure that, Lord. you know, I mean, you know, when I... Oh, <laughs> come here, come here, that's come a good one. Come here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> If I could Charlie Davies time. just meowed. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, let's get started with the soccer talk. <laughs> uh, Toronto, Montreal in the Canadian Championship. As we all expected, the Canadian Premier League couldn't quite hold on here. Cavalry had a good run. Oh, hard. Wasn't to be. I mean, I, you figured that Toronto, Montreal would push through. They knocked and, off an MLS team, though. Yeah. Respect true. to the Cavalry. Yep. And they uh, are doing what they normally do in this tournament, which is face off for the final. And there's a CCL place on the line. So that ought to be very, very interesting. We'll talk about that more when it's a little closer. But let's talk about the trophy that was awarded. Campeones, campeones, ole, ole, ole. Boy, you really dropped it down. I like that, yeah. Susanna. Listen, I got a, I got a yeah. wide range. You got some pipes. <laughs> we were not there, the three of us. No. Dave was. Boom. It was a lot of fun. It was, awesome. it was exactly what I would want from this game, which yeah. is, you know, not that serious, but serious enough. Good highlights, good fun, lots of talent on the field, dramatic result, and you know what? It helps at MLS 1. Their first Final since against Liga MX since 1998. That was uh, the old Champions Cup. DC United knocked off Toluca. But this morning in Mexico, you see newspapers with first loser <laughs> on the cover. Short-term memories in Ouch. the Mexican media. Yes, yes. That's a key to their profession. <laughs> Campeones Cup tat. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I put it on the back of my thigh. <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, more space there so I can get it bigger and stuff. It was awesome. It was like, you know, you, you went last year. So you felt it a little bit, but Tigris in Toronto is not going to draw like Club America in Atlanta. I think a little bit. Felt it a little bit is the key. Term I was there. thinking of us last yeah. night. Well, I was watching you guys doing your your thing in the studio last night, and Goss was there. And Andrew, I was thinking of our experience in Toronto mm. last year and how I had such FOMO last night because last year it was just, I mean, it came in an odd time for Toronto. They were trying to make the playoffs, and they just really, they were battered and 
beaten down and it you know the tigres just kind of yeah it was like this extra apart. thing that they just couldn't exactly deal with. and so it felt you know there, there wasn't that sense of like excitement and urgency and watching the scenes at mercedes-benz and watching the packed house and the fans of of both clubs just like up for it and the teams up for it i was like oh man this 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 is what it should yeah, be exactly this is what it should be in it's, the mind's eye that's what it's supposed to be it's an yeah. opportunity to put the best talent in the region on the field and that's I mean, okay, you can argue Club America where they're at and Atlanta where they're at, but the reality of it is there was few moments in history where you could walk onto a soccer field in the United States and play a genuine competitive game with that amount of talent on the field. And that's what it felt like when you were there, when you saw PT and Joseph going up against Roger Martinez and Henry Martin. Like, these are all players who can start in a World Cup tomorrow, and they're playing for their teams in a competitive game. And you could feel it in the speed of play. You could feel it in the intensity of the play. And you saw it in the quality, which was so much fun because maybe it's not the most important championship yet, and so they both came out and played, which you may not see in a CCL final, but they wanted it, and there was the intensity and passion there. I mean, Frank DeBoer, I thought, was going to rip his shirt off after the game. Like, he was just amped about the game. And I asked the first question. He was just like, well, look at the drama on the field. Like, look at the chaos and the energy. And he's like, we're winning 1v1 duels. And he was so pumped about it. And I was standing next to Hector Vialba when Laurentowitz scored out of nowhere. <laughs> and just to see him, like, screaming and pumping. And you're like, this is for real. And it's good. It's just really good soccer. And I think for all of us who enjoy the game and, and want to watch these games, you feel it when you go to an Atlanta, New York Red Bulls game. You feel it at El Trafico. That's what it felt like. And you're like, hmm, how can we do this as much as possible? By the way, uh, America is undefeated right now in Apertura. They have three wins and a draw. They knocked off, I think, Monterey earlier in the year. They obviously beat Tigres and the Campeon de Campeones to get here. So they're not maybe not at the top of the Mexican game right but now, they're, but they're, they're right top. there. They're, 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 they're the part. biggest club. They're not at their best, probably. Sure. And this was a young group that they're rotating through. But there was still one, five guys on the one field lineup, who are going to Yeah, one lineup change from the weekend in mm -hmm. Liga MX. That tells you what... Piojo thought of and this. And you could see post game from Piojo. I asked, we asked a few questions and it was like, we screwed up. Like he was pissed and he was well spoken because he's Piojo and that's what he does, but he was upset with the way this game went and he wanted the win. What are we taking from this, Charlie? What do you take from this? Does it matter that Atlanta won this and got over at least like the speed bump? I'm not going to call it they got over the hump because yeah. the hump is obviously CCL, but this is a speed bump. It, for Atlanta, this is one of those moments where the team comes together. You you go through a tough game. Deborah said after the game, it was a game that was meant for men. It was, it was a physical game. Both teams won. Hombre, hombre, <laughs> and there was there was real challenges for a team to go up against Club America. Granted, they're they're not the 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 top team in Mexico, but they're a, a team that has all these dynamic players, dangerous players. Guido Rodriguez, fantastic. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and they prevailed. That's a big thing for not only Atlanta, but MLS. But in this in this particular case, Atlanta needed a little bit more uh, camaraderie, like the chemistry within the locker room. P.D. Martinez looks like a, a new player. He looks like a new signing now. He looks like the guy they had always wanted. Dynamic, gets on the ball, beats people on the dribble, shows his burst of, of speed, um, dangerous with his left foot, connecting with guys. And, and Nagby really came out and showed – He's one of the best players in the league. When he plays like he did yesterday, which he was the best player on the field, it makes you wonder what is what's going wrong with him. Is it is it is it his his ambition? Is it consistency? Because the way he played last night, being able to connect passes, um, dictate the tempo, uh, play one twos, set up the goals. He was involved in the first goal, the build up, the one two with J uh, Joseph Martinez, and he plays Dion Pereira, who also I thought uh, did a fantastic job last night, assisted um, on the first goal, and then the second goal. Uh, our third goal, being alert. So he knows there's a player on his back. There's a cross in. It gets headed out. Because he already took a peek and he knew where Jeff Lorenowitz was and the defender, he was able to shield him so that Jeff Lorenowitz could get on the ball and take that shot. It's just the little things he was doing well all, all night from, from minute one to minute 90. He lost the ball in the first half, bad pass. He tracked all the way back to win it back at the top of the 18. Those little things is what the men's national team needs. Right, it's a player that can keep possession. He was always the outlet. Now, if if Darlington Abbey plays like that every single game, he's the best player the United States have outside of Christian Pulisic. 
So, Michael Parker has tweeted after this fact. My boy Darlington Nagby is the best two-way midfielder in North America. That's a pretty big claim. He also burned him in the same tweet. Showed yeah. the uh, video of the goalkeeper running right past Darlington Nagby. Demarcus Beasley's watching this game, and I'm, I'm here for unfiltered Demarcus Beasley. How is Nagby still in this country, he says, unless he doesn't want to leave. But, man, what a player. I'm biased because that's well, my homie. But I don't think anyone would disagree with how good he is. And this is I, – I want to I dig in on this before we get to Joseph's hop and some other things from this game. Let's just revisit – at Darlington Nagby. He doesn't get rated by the soccer public, it seems. Mm -hmm. They've kind of given up on him for the U.S. national team, and I think you'd probably have to include a lot of us in that because when we talk about the U.S., we don't really anymore talk about Darlington Nagby. Did we – did the expectations at the beginning, like, skew our view? Did it put it through the wrong prism to where we were saying, well, we need these special moments all the time, be a dominating player, as opposed to, like – you in the right system and the right team with the right people around you could be incredible. Because I'm last night daydreaming about, you know, Adams at the six, Nagby as that connector in the midfield, and then maybe a McKinney or a Pomichol alongside and provide a little bit more defensive bite. Like, why wouldn't that work? Why couldn't Nagby be a part of Greg Berhalter's national team? He could. I'm, he just needs to show. I, I want to hear him come out and press and say, I want to be a part of it. I want to be on the national team. Well, that's I hard want to take you have to next... say something in the press. Well, I want I want a clear intention from him, whether it's in Atlanta's media and just saying, I, I hope to be on the national team. I hope to be involved. That's what I'm working for. I, I'd love I'm to hear from Greg. Because yeah. I, I know he, there was a little bit of ambition to go overseas. And the Celtic interest, he went over there. He tore, He got a tour from from Brendan Rodgers. Uh, there, there was clear interest. And he, he was all about it. He, was, he wanted to go. It didn't happen. Was he all about it? He was all about it. I talked to him about it. So he wanted to go, and it didn't work out. There was never out. a time where he said, no, I'm not going to go. I know initially when Celtic came, mm -hmm. uh, he went over to Celtic. He loved it. He loved the environment, loved the facilities, saw the team. He said, okay, this is, I can do this. And it, I got a coach that believes in me, speaks English, Brendan Rodgers. But then the, wherever it fell, fell through, whether it was uh, Merritt Polson or, or Celtic, the valuation uh, with the league – it didn't work out. Initially, he wanted to go. After that, maybe there was a, mm, I'm good here. I'll stay in the United States. I'm happy with my family. Charlie, I have a question from a player's perspective. When you put it out there like that, if Darlington Nagby were to say, yeah, like I would really love that call from, from Greg Berhalter, does that, put, does that put the pressure on Greg Berhalter or, or is that more pressure – on yourself like what happens when that dialogue starts and suddenly you're like no this is actually what I want and then you know maybe people start talking about it on social media like what's the what's the effect on the player when that situation happens in this case I feel that Darlington Nagby has uh, an unfair bias uh, about him in the sense that they think he doesn't care about being involved in the national team, that he's happy with being at home, being he's a homebody, just being around my family and and just taking care of of work at with Atlanta United. I think when you do call out and say, I'm I'm ready, I'm 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 here, I'm playing well, now all the eyeballs are on you in every single performance. Every game they want to see, okay, he's doing this well or he's not doing that well. So you're going to get called out when you don't perform well, right? But if you continue to put these performances together, if he strings another game uh, like he did last night for 10 straight, he better be called in. I can tell you that because he's <laughs> that good. And everyone I talk to, January camps, I've been with Darlington Nagby, they all say the same thing. He is phenomenal on the ball. He's you the best cannot, possession player. You cannot take the ball off him. He, he was doing 360s, like double 360s <laughs> around Club America players but this, last night. But, Just like, come and get me. But you, this you isn't new. Here. He's been we doing this talked, all season for Atlanta, too. He's been doing this his whole MLS yeah. career. There's never been a time when we have talked about Donald Gennady and not said he is the best player in tight spaces on the ball in the system. In the U.S. soccer pool. The question is, one, how often does he go and get the ball? Like, how active is he in the game? How much does he want to be seen, not vocally, just physically in the game, which has been question marks? And then, two, what else does he bring? Because if he can do that at a super high level, which he did last night, right? Guido Rodriguez, an Argentine national team player, pressuring player him. Player of the year. Mexican player of the right. year. Right, pressuring him, and he's picking up the ball, and as you said, turning him and getting out of space. And I remind you, not playing alongside Barco and Eric Rometty, but Jeff Lorenzo and Emerson Hyman. Not a knock on them, but at a different level, and he was a crutch for them, and he made it possible for them. But he doesn't do that every single game. And so it's not, I don't think on the media, or I don't think it's on the coaching staff to identify him. It's on him 
to step up consistently and do that game in and game out. Whatever we saw in that game, I want to see more of <laughs> because it was it was fun to watch. It was Darlington beauty. And Nagby. Beautiful. Joseph Martinez, we know he likes to hop on the PKs. He did the most ridiculous, like, oversized, pause in the air, look at the goalkeeper hop on the first PK that Pity Martinez drew. By the way, Pity Martinez knows how to draw him a PK. Yeah, and does not get to shoot. Ever. No. No, he doesn't. Well, he's like, you know, he's got to draw him so he can beg for him. You know, if he doesn't draw him, he doesn't get the opportunity. And, you know, it's like, well, maybe someday Joseph will give it up. It, that no, day has, not, not, that not, day has not come, and I don't think it's <laughs> maybe going a, to come. Maybe a friendly. So, so Joseph misses on the hop, and that's two out of three on the hop that he had missed because he put one over against DC against but Bill Hamid. So then they draw another penalty later on, and he doesn't hop. To hop or not to hop, what should Joseph Martinez no, he do? On the no, he didn't. Just yeah, on the did. no, on the on the one he made. Yeah, he no, hopped. no, he didn't hop. He did he not. Hop. I was he standing hopped. six he, feet away from he him. Hopped he, hopped. Up, he hopped on the goal celebration. No, he hopped. He did not hop. I did not see a hop. He did a little hesit, a slight hesitation. There was no hop. There was no like up on I one leg. I right hate leg the hop. Paused. You hate the hop. Hate the hop. I I just I don't like watching it. It <laughs> like may, I just think it's ugly and like. Ugh, I, it's not an it, aesthetically it, pleasing. Not aesthetically pleasing. Also, I just think like it allows for too many. Like you, you give yourself like that extra like half a second, and like so many things can go wrong. We've seen him, you know, sky it or like miss yeah. it on the first one. I just, I, I'm not, not about it. The not new, about the the, hop. New, the new rule allows keepers to have to stay on the line, so you're giving the keeper now extra time to adjust because he can't jump out and guess. They, they can't afford to guess like that anymore because they can't jump out um you know two yards in front of that yeah. line before the kick so if you're giving him extra time to wait and now you can't because keepers stay on the line longer you can't like wait for them to move first you're screwed it just feels like accuracy would be an issue and also <laughs> it kind of feels like with that right foot that you're going to be going to your right the majority of the time which he did on the one that was saved as opposed to coming across your body i don't know we'll see what he decides to do but you'd think he would want to stay consistent previously that was the hop it worked then it didn't work and he's not giving up PK. He's so not going to sure. hop anymore i can guarantee you guarantee that, that? Gonna are you going to guarantee no hops i'm not going to guarantee okay <laughs> But he's not going to hop. All right. Congratulations to I'm Atlanta hopper, United. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Campeones Cup champions, the second ever uh, edition of this game. It's one to one. Tigres has one. Atlanta United have one. Uh, Portland, Atlanta. We have the MLS Cup rematch this weekend on Sunday, 10 p.m. Eastern on FS1. Portland got a 3 2 win at home against the Chicago Fire. That's two straight in their 10 home game run. Two wins. Good for them. I was just going to say a little more Atlanta news. It sounds like Rometty missed yesterday with an injury. Franco Escobar taken out right before halftime with one as well. Uh, George Bello probably not back yet. So not full complement of players for DeBoer going over. It, this game's going to be fascinating because I've been down in Atlanta for the last week. They played NYCFC and Club America, and Frank DeBoer specifically said both times, we like playing against teams that want to play the way we play, which now – is open and in possession. It wasn't at the start of the year. He created a team that was defensively based, and over the last two months, they say all of the ideas that they've been working on in training are going forward, attacking in space, which is why they've become more fun to watch and the team that we're a little bit more familiar with. It's interesting because that's not how Portland's played well. And at home, the question is, can they break teams down? But if Atlanta comes out and opens up, that's perfect for Portland to sit in and hit on the counter. So this is going to be a fascinating game this weekend. I will be there. So anybody in Portland who sees me wandering around, <laughs> lost. Voodoo donuts. Uh, I've been told not to go, Charlie. Oh, but what I was the other one? Blue Star. Is Blue it Star? Blue Star Donuts? Mm. I think Wait, you're not going to Voodoo? Why? I don't know. My, D yeah. my DMs are open. I'm getting a lot of recommendations. Again, if you see me wandering around, yeah. say what's up. I would love to uh, chat with some MLS fans out in Portland. They have really good kombucha at the uh, stadium. Not a, not a kombucha <laughs> guy. Kombucha. Mm, wow, Definitely. you guys oh. nixed yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah down I'm with kombucha. Them. That's uh, It's nah. like sour, gross tea. <laughs> it's, it's not, I'm not about that. <laughs> really oh. locked in on this. Hey, but I, it's I, all about the trends. Yeah, Poor we'll guys. be at the Thorns game on Saturday, so <laughs> maybe you'll see me there as well. Let's talk uh, about Wilmer Cabrera and the Dynamo. Wilmer, the fourth coach to lose his job this season. Houston, they've struggled. They lost their last four, two and eleven, and one in their last fourteen. I think ten losses in their last twelve. That's not good. Nope. Made the playoffs in 2017 when he took over. Did not make the playoffs last year, but they did win U.S. Open Cup. It looks like they will not make the playoffs this year. They're six points out and they are fading. And Wilmer is no longer the head coach as a result. 32, 39, and 22 is his record as the head coach of the Dynamo. And now to help us understand the decision is Matt Jordan, the general manager of the club. It's our AT&T call to the field. Matt, how's it going? 
Hey, guys. How you doing? Andrew, David, Charlie, Susanna, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. We appreciate you coming on and remembering everyone's names. <laughs> well done, Matt. Well done. Let's just dive right in here. Of course, the big news, Wilmer Cabrera dismissed as the head coach of the Dynamo. Why let Wilmer go and why now? Yeah, look, it was a very difficult decision. Uh, we have, as a club, a tremendous amount of respect and appreciation for everything that Wilmer has done in the last two and a half years as the head coach of, of the Dynamo. Uh, really coming off this last road trip um, in communication with our ownership group and our board, uh, we collectively felt that it was uh, the right time to make this decision. Uh, and, you know, really now with with you know, this being a challenging week with change, you know, comes opportunity, you know, and so now the focus has shifted to, to supporting Davey and the staff and the, and the players as they prepare for the game this weekend against Colorado. We know that the results, especially recently, were not there. Is this strictly, strictly results, excuse me? Is there a coaching issue, the way that you guys were getting XYZ out of your talent? Is it a roster problem? What, what was the big issue here that led to Wilmer just not getting what he needed to stay in the job? Well, you know, look, I think the, you know, Wilmer and the whole staff have, have, have been putting a lot of work into things um, and looking at really from the end of May to the beginning of June, you know, we, we dropped 11 of 14 games in MLS play and we were 3-12-2 in, in all competitions. And, you know, looking at everything holistically, you know, we, we had the best start in club history this year uh, and, and we were off to a good start. Obviously, we had a tough last couple of months, but I don't think anybody feels that um, the results the last couple of months is a reflection of the quality of the roster. You know, it's, it's been challenging and there's a lot of factors that play into this, you know, and so, um, you know, and, and obviously you, you hit, you know, the, the dog days of summer in the MLS and, and everything that you guys know real well. Uh, but really collectively we felt that this was the right time to take the decision and, and we wish Wilmer nothing but the best moving forward. So, Matt, tell us, where are you at in the interview process right now for the next coach? Has it begun already? Yeah, well, you know, really, once, once you know, any change like that occurs, I mean, you're, you know, everybody is reaching out and your phone's blowing up. And, and I mean, we've had a tremendous amount of interest in the position. I think the key at the moment is, is that we want to focus, you know, you, you really want to make sure that the group is, has all the communication necessary and, and, and the coaches and, and, and Davey in particular have the support to prepare for the weekend. I think for us what's important is we're not going to rush into any decisions. We're not going to make any reactionary decisions. We're going to take our time. We're going to do our due diligence, and it's going to be a very detailed process. You know, and we have a lot of you know, key characteristics that we're going to keep in mind that, that we're going to evaluate as we're going through this process. You mentioned the due diligence. What have you learned from the past processes you've been a part of, hiring Wilmer, hiring guys up in Montreal as well, and what are those characteristics you're looking for? Well, I think the most important thing is that you have to find a head coach that, that fits within the strategic plan of the club and, and within, your, within our, our core values that's a strong leader uh, and for us also understands our structure. I, you know, we obviously we put a lot of work in our academy, our USL setup, and our first team. You know, so I think a big part of this, and we believe a big part of this, is also the next candidate is committed to continuing to build on the infrastructure that's in place and shows that level of commitment to, to build a culture of development. So those are the key factors that, that we're, we're focusing on in this process, and, and we'll take our time. Uh, you know, we're very fortunate that Davey um, – you know, is someone that's very well respected in the locker room and amongst the staff and, and with the club. And he's, he's ready to do whatever possible to help support the club. And he's very hardworking. He's very committed, got strong, strong values. Uh, and most importantly, he's got a growth mindset. Uh, so I think that, you know, he's, he's stepped right in, you know, and, and is doing everything he can along with his staff and our support staff to help the guys prepare for this weekend. Matt, is there any way that Davey Arno could win this job if he's to guide them to the playoffs after you know this rough start, um, you know, towards the middle of the season? Could he still win this job? Yeah, Charlie. No, Davey for sure is, is going to be in consideration for for the job. Um, you know, and while we're we're doing a, we're doing a very detailed search as well, um, 
and I think you know we feel we feel we've got a good roster. I mean, this is the same roster that had the best start in club history, and I'd argue we were one of the most aggressive teams in the summer transfer window uh, with the trades of Christian Ramirez, Nico Hansen, and the transfer of, of Jose Bazama, who's up and coming with the Chilean national team. So we're not sitting back. And, and resting on anything. You know, we, we, we feel we've got a good group. We've got a good team. Uh, and these new additions, we feel, will give us a boost to make a good push. And, yeah, Davey will, will be considered for the role as well. Davey's a certain kind of candidate, a guy from within the league, a player who's had a lot of experience here, come up with his assistant coach. But we've seen Major League Soccer go a little bit of a different way recently with the Frank DeBoers and Mateus Almeidas of the world, Patrick Vieira, Tata Martino, the defending uh, cup champion. When you think about that ideal candidate and what experience, what attributes they have to have, are you thinking MLS experience within the league? Do you want to go outside and shoot big? Where do you stand on some of that? We're open. We're open, uh, and and you know that's also in communication with our ownership group. I mean, we need to, we need to evaluate and be open to all different options. Uh, and I've I've you know have been a part of this process. You know, working with a with here in in Houston and also in Montreal, and and I've I've had the privilege of working with domestic coaches, uh, coaches that have been in the national team setup, foreign coaches. So I, I think I, I have a unique background in the process. Uh, and so, you know, I'll just do my best and, and work with, with our board and our ownership group to, to evaluate uh, and, and collectively we'll make a decision that's ultimately the key with all this is it, it's about the club. And, and that's really an important core value for us is every decision we take uh, with the Houston Dynamo, everything is about the club. And, and we're, we're definitely uh, a club first organization and, and and that's one of our key core values that's never going to change matt it's been a tough go for the dynamo over the past five seasons only appearing in the playoffs once how much pressure is there on this hire for you personally to get it right yeah look i think there's there's always pressure i mean this is professional sports and you know and and, and that's 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 just that's just a part of it and i think you know, with, with pressure also, again, you know, comes uh, opportunity as well. Um, I think for us, you know, in the, last, in the last five years, I mean, MLS has changed, having been in the league since the very beginning. I feel like the last five years, MLS has changed more than it did the previous 15 years. And so really what the key is for a lot of clubs that have been in the league for a long time is, you know, how are we going to evolve? How are we going to Im- implement our strategic plan that is going gonna, is gonna to help us continue to remain competitive. And I think we've done that. Look at our roster. You know, we're one of the youngest, most dynamic rosters. We have some of the, the best young attackers in Major League Soccer. We have experience. We have players that have played in World Cups. We have, you know, we have national team players that are currently competing. We have Europeans. We have South Americans. We have Americans. We, I mean, and that's something that we're very proud of is, is – the makeup of our roster is also a reflection of our city, and, and that will be another key factor in the next hire is, is that um, our next head coach understands the soccer community and, and the culture here and also understands what, what we're building. Matt, keeping in theme with that sort of big picture element here, what do you see as the identity of the Houston Dynamo, and what is it that you guys need to kind of help fulfill that vision that you have for it? Well, I think it, the, our identity has changed as MLS has changed. Uh, and that really, uh, Susanna, goes back to, you know, what I was just saying of, of how, how much the, the league has changed in the last five, six years with, with expansion, with the infusion of TAM money. Uh, and, and really, you know, we've had to evolve. That's been the key thing for us is to evolve. And really, you know, Major League Soccer teams, you know, they're, they're soccer they're soccer organizations, and that's what, what I mean, and that's where when I talk about infrastructure, it's really important to put a proper infrastructure in place. You know, your, your youth development setup, which we've just completely restructured our whole academy in the last 12 months. You know, building out a scouting department, building out your sports science department, uh, you know, continuing to look at how can, can you, you know, have these pieces in place to help the organization. So that's one thing I am proud of is that, Amidst, you know, it's it's difficult to make a change like like this. There's no doubt about it, and 
And uh, but you know, I think that we've you know, amidst making a difficult decision, um, it's been a good transition because we have a sound infrastructure in place. So for me, that's the most important thing uh, organizationally um, with our strategic plan. I mean. You've seen, you look at our roster and you see, you know, we, we look to bring in young, young, talented players that we think have upside and, and have the ability to grow with us that we, we look to, you know, help move on to the next level. Uh, American players in their prime and then players from, from within our organization, you know, meaning coming from our academy and our USL setup. So those are really, you know, those are the three key buckets that we continue to focus on that we believe will help us remain competitive as MLS continues to evolve. Matt, we'll get to Mauro Minotas and Albert Elise, They're the subject of transfer rumors all the time these days. But you mentioned the academy and restructuring that in the past year. And I think it's hard for people not to look at Dallas up the road who are seemingly churning out first teamers out of their academy and wonder why the Dynamo aren't doing that. From what you've seen and the reasons why you restructured, why hasn't that been more successful, the academy? I think, well, first of all, we, we hired Paul Holliker, who, you know, we were so pleased to have, you know, Paul, someone that was a player in the MLS. He had an extensive uh, background in coaching and, and in youth development. And really what's been important for us as he's come in is, is to have a very clear, uh, clearly identified game model and, and clearly defined principles of play with each of our key, you know, three key phases of development, not to get too much into the weeds. But, you know, that's been really important for us um, with, internally within our club, but I think also what we've really made a big emphasis on over the last 12 months is is strengthening our relationships within the community. I don't think we have the best reputation in our own community in that space, um, and so that's something that we're really working on to, to form form a lot of uh, and strengthen our strategic partnerships and and really utilize the diversity of the city. You know, and, and that's something. That, that we believe is, is going to be a key component for us in the future. You know, Houston is the most diverse city in the United States. And I'm not saying only uh, uh, of, of Latin origin. You know, you're looking, it's, it's a melting pot. You know, it's, it's South Americans. There's uh, African, uh, a big African community or big Asian community. I mean, it's, it's, that's the beauty of our city. And so it's important for us, you know, as we go into the next head coaching hire, but also with our strategic plan that, that, that uh, our market is reflected in, in each decision we make. Matt, with former U.S. men's national team great uh, Demarcus Beasley retiring at the end of the season, are there any plans to bring him back into the fold as in the front office or uh, as a potential coach? Well, Demarcus right now, I know his, his sole focus, and he's such a competitor. You know, he really wants to finish the season strong. You know, he and I were talking yesterday, and, and, and you know, that's his sole focus. And, and, I mean, you guys know him as well. I mean, there's there's not a <laughs> there's not a, a bigger competitor out there than him, you know. And so that's his his sole focus, and you know, and he's such an incredible leader for us as an organization. You know, I know he's going to have a, a, a tremendous amount of opportunities, you know, with whatever he decides to do. I mean, you never know. He may even you know he may even decide he may want to play uh, one more year, knowing what, what type of competitor he is. But you know, um, we're we're really happy and proud to have him part of our organization. You mentioned how aggressive your team was in the summer transfer window. Christian Ramirez, a big center forward. It felt like maybe some of those moves could be with an eye for sales later on. Mauro Minotis and Albert Elise, of course, have been rumored over the last few windows. Have you gotten concrete offers? Are you in a place where you're ready to make that move this winter, even if your coach isn't in place? Yeah, no, we we for sure are really pleased to have, to be able to add Christian uh, to our roster. I mean, he, again, if you go back to those kind of three buckets that we were talking about before, uh, he fits perfectly into a uh, domestic or American player in their prime. That's a proven goal scorer in the league is a, is great professional. Um, so we're really pleased to add Christian. You know, we believe Nico Hansen has, has a big upside uh, and, and, you know, we, he can bring something to the table for us. Jose Bazama is a very good player as well, uh, who has a lot of upsides, just 24 years old. So we're really pleased to add those three players. Yeah, you're always looking to, to build a succession plan. Um, you know, we have had, you know, firm offers for our players. Um, you mentioned uh, Morrow and, and Albert. And, and, you know, we have several other young, talented players that, we, that we've gotten a lot of interest in from outside the league. Uh, so it's it, anytime you're evaluating 
you know, if you're going to move out a player, you know, it, it's something that has to make sense for the club. It has to make sense for the player. There's, there's agents involved. There's, there's a lot of different factors. And so I think, you know, those are things that we're continually evaluating. And, and, and again, we'll, we'll make the best decision that's in the best interest for the club. All right, we'll see what happens with Morrow and Albert, of course, and what happens with the head coaching job. Davey Arno, the interim for now at the Houston Dynamo, uh, that process starting up for Matt Jordan, the GM of the club. Matt, thank you so much for joining us, answering our questions. Good luck the rest of the way, okay? Thank you, We, uh, we uh, and I appreciate your time. Have a good day. Big thanks to Matt Jordan for coming on, answering our questions. Uh, what do you think here? Playoffs are not out of reach. They're six points out right now. If you're a Houston Dynamo fan, you got to lock in right now for a little bit, I think, because when you watch clubs in MLS, clubs around the world, there's a reaction to a coach being fired. Because one is the ownership of the team has said it's not good enough and we are willing to take steps, which applies to the players and they can't be moved as quickly or at the same time. But everyone knows that exists. Matt Jordan mentioned the new talent coming in. So you actually have some new options. You're going to get a new voice. And we've already seen an MLS this year. Look at Connor Casey in Colorado. Like it just generates a new energy obviously Bruce Arena in New England, a fresh perspective. And so you're six points out in a Western Conference that is absolute chaos. Everyone's going to be knocking off each other every single weekend. For the Houston Dynamo and for fans, you've now got something to watch for. See over the next few weeks if they show some life, they're back in the race. And if they don't show life, maybe that means that you might see Mauro Minotas and Albert Elise moved? Yeah. I'm gonna, maybe? I'm going to say they still have a chance at the playoffs, and I think that's why they made the coaching decision right now, because things have gone stale and they think they still have a talented enough roster to make a run now Davey Arno is un- unproven right but this is an opportunity for him to take and say okay guys let's get this going they play this weekend home against Colorado Rapids if you do not get a result you can you can ship it in <laughs> mail it in mail it in mail it in but if they do I think that's going to bre- breathe some life into the squad and say okay we have something going let's ride this out Susanna, you kind of honed in on the identity of the club mm-hmm. and what the future might look like in that interview. What would you think of Matt Jordan's answers? And when you think about who might be the next head coach of this club, what what stands out to you? Oh, man. I don't know. Um, it was a little bit vague. I think his uh, his response into in the identity question, and I think that's fair because I do think that they are a club that's in transition right mm-hmm. now and they're actively trying to find out that identity. How do we compete? As he said, the league has changed. How do we compete? Exactly. With our, you know, and we've seen the like the release on salaries. Right. The Dynamo are generally not at the top. They're no. generally bottom half. And and yeah, I, I, we've seen with LAFC and Atlanta and teams like that. These teams that are are super successful. They've got a big payroll. They're signing these big splashy DPS. And I also I, I was. So not surprised that the Wilmer Cabrera era kind of ended as sourly as it did, because when he was hired, I thought this is the right guy Mm -hmm. for the job, especially in Houston with all the the Spanish speaking players and his ability to kind of, you know, recruit. And and so I I kind of see them going in a, a direction where. They will want to go after talent from South America, Central America um, and and get those guys to come come play because that's a formula that we've seen work here. But you know, as Matt said, I mean, they're open to anything. So they haven't really honed in on a direction. It seems like it's kind of everything's very much up in the yeah, air. Yeah, everything's in play is which what makes I took away. Me, which makes me um, not so confident for the rest of the season for them because I just think that there are too many question marks surrounding a, a, whole, a whole lot of issues on that team right now. From the academy to the first team to the coaching to the, just the identity, if you're looking around for candidates out there, Paul Tenere had a nice article at The Athletic. MLS assistants, maybe Robin Frazier, Kerry Savagnin, Pat Noonan, a CJ Brown perhaps, Steve Ralston, I don't know where he's at right now but I wouldn't be surprised if the player if the coach they hire is a first time head coach because I think they've already gone through a couple options but one of the things with Wilmer Carrera is he's from a different era of the game and he he's been very good in his career working with young players communicating with them but big picture ideas of how a team plays what your philosophy is I wouldn't be surprised if they go with someone who is new but has big ideas that they want to bring in. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's a player who played in Central or mm-hmm. South America or played in MLS and has the ability to connect to those players you talked about that they want to recruit. Could Tab Ramos then be a name for this mm. job? As they talk about how they want to integrate the academy and have young players, Central America, South America, Tab's played in Mexico. He's Recruited for yeah. the U-20 national team. Yeah, I mean, he so. could be he yeah. could be that sort of guy. Uh, we'll see what happens with Houston Dynamo. We'll keep you up to date. As always, Jason Christ doesn't have an MLS job right now. Frank Klopas doesn't, Carl Robinson, Brad Friedel. 
I don't Jason know. Christ does have a job. Well, he doesn't have an MLS job. Yeah, he's working with Inter Miami. Uh, I thought he was the head coach of maybe their second team. He is currently in South Korea with their U19s or okay. U18. All right, well, first maybe a first, maybe, I don't know. I'm just he's throwing, also the USU just throwing names out there right now. Uh, MLS Week 24 is ongoing. We got the first playoff scenario email in the inbox from Rick Laws. <laughs> The czar of numbers here at Major League Soccer. <laughs> LAFC will clinch a berth in the Audi sure, MLS Cup playoffs if they win against Real Salt Lake and FC Dallas lose or tie against the Montreal Impact. That's the only sort of scenario right now. You kind of jumped the gun here, Charlie, but I'm going to come back to it. We don't have Doyle, so we don't have the Reaper. We don't have like the, <laughs> you know, what is it, mm-hmm. the Scythe? Yep. Uh, and I don't want to eulogize teams until they're officially out, so we won't eulogize them. There's, Math you can, says, though. Ma- uh, you can. Math says nobody's technically out, but who is the regular season come for? Like, who is it just – who's who's out? Who's like, on vacation now? Wise? Not vacation, but, you know, they can look forward yeah. to November and say, I could probably book a nice Caribbean vacation, uh, you know, if I have the points or whatever uh, whatever it might be. FC Cincinnati? Gone. You're going to put you right there. Yep. You're out. Crew, gone. Crew are gone for you. Fire, gone. Wow, <laughs> fire, fire. Three points out. Turned out Charlie was going to name half the league. Yeah, fire, Vancouver, oh. gone. Okay. <laughs> Colorado, gone. Oh, Those I fun. agree with. Yep. Sporting, Sporting KC, KC oh, gone. See you later. Oh, man. Yeah, oh. I'd say gone, too. They're nine, oh. they're nine points out and, right and now. Th- th- and it's just... Those are for sure done. No. But I can't. I, I'm not ruling out Houston, right? I'm not ruling out Dallas. I'm not ruling out Orlando City or Toronto. Mm. Okay. So just explain to me the Chicago Fire. They did go to Portland and lose 3-2, mm-hmm. to two, but they got a last-second win at the weekend. They're only three points, uh, miraculously, three points out of the playoffs. Yep. They played 27 games, so that's more than everybody yep. else. But, like, hey, crazier things are happening. And if the Dynamo six points out, you guys are so confident they could get back into it, why couldn't the Fire? Because the Dynamo changed something. Mm, good point. That's what we made us com- – well, not confident. That's what gives the belief is gotcha. things right. have changed. That's the wild card. Yeah, Chicago's been the same for three years now. And no back line. It's it's so inconsistent. Uh, they leak goals. They literally, their addition to the back line was a guy in Calvo who makes big mistakes, who is super talented but makes big mistakes, and which is almost the essence of the club. And Schweinsteiger. Yeah. It's the essence of the club. Is There's a ton of talent. It doesn't fit together, and they make big mistakes to lose in big moments. Uh, kind of like the Houston Dynamo. Also, the Fire just don't win on the road. Yeah. And One win this season away, nine they losses. Have four away games remaining, too. Mm, yeah. So those are, I, I think when I wrote about them saying, hey, probably not going to make it, it was yeah. pointing at the away games. Yeah. Saying, oh, oh, that, that could yeah. be bad. Okay. So I think I'm yep. with you on everybody but the fire. Oh. But I probably do agree with okay. you. I just feel like, oh, three <laughs> points. I'm trying to talk myself into it. Mm-hmm. So we have that there. How, can I ask you what? as a local and a native? Sure, sure. How sure. big is it if Sporting KC doesn't make the playoffs this year? I think it's big, but I think that Kansas City fans look at the job Peter Vermees has done and the consistency they've had, and the vast majority of kind of the hardcore people that have followed it from, you know, not even from Wizards days, but from the early sporting days, understand that they've been pretty spoiled and that they have consistently hit above where they might be expected to, sometimes way, way above. It also helps that they've won. Championships. What if what if Peter Vermees at the end of this year, if it ends the way it looks, says, "Hey, we had a lot of injuries. We're going to bring back a similar that, group." That would I think would start to rile people. I, I'll tell you right now, he would not do that. You think so? I, I, he would not. You don't think that. he looks at his team and says, "We're good enough to well, be no. a good team. Here, no. Here's the problem: is they no. they re-signed a bunch of those guys, the Tam deals, yeah. the ones at the top, the you know the Rogers, the Zusies, the Beasleys, Illy. Ilya, yeah, and so. But there's still another group that they could go, they could go upgrade. Like they could go get a DP forward. They could go spend some more money. Which they've like, been talking about getting a DP forward for so years. So it's time to find the right fit. It's time to find well, my guy like, Roger Martinez is out here. The echelon of talent that the other teams at the top of the West they, are competing they, with. I also think you can't under you City. can't underestimate the injury factor, though. I mean, See? they've been which he can claim decimated. They've, they've, it's been rough agree, all there's season. There's also a lot of older players that you're relying on, so True. inevitably at some point you have to say that's going to happen. One of those players they were relying on previously, one Ike Opara. Everybody, myself included, beginning of the season figured, you know what? Wait, Ike. Ike is just going to have to pull this Minnesota team up by the bootstraps. Kansas City's going to have a better year. Look at him rolling in CCL. Oh, boy. Uh, well, it didn't end up that way because Minnesota United are second in the Western Conference all by themselves on 41 points, one6 four points per game, 36 points is how many they got in each of their first two seasons in MLS, and they now have nine games with five points above that mark. Uh, they knocked off the Rapids 1-0, 
midweek at home, big wing, got to hear their Oasis song. That's what they like to do. I want to have this conversation since we're talking Ike Opara. Who is the defender of the year right now? Could Ike win this thing? You know who else wants to have that conversation? Ike Opara. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ike Opara working on the rundown, baby. Ike, you know, yeah. Ike, we'll pay, we'll, we'll trade Tam to Benny and Sal if you want to come on air. <laughs> what, uh, Benny and Sal, there's no podcast. Ike's not on a podcast. Oh, that's true. He's not. He's right. just he's a like guest. A, he's like a, he's an oftentimes guest he's a for Benny guest. and Sal's Ooh. podcast, which they own exclusively. That Ike, we sh- Ike, this is a podcast that This cares. is an invitation. Look, if we- you want to come here, we'll put your name. It'll be Ike Time Radio. Radio. We, we don't use radio anymore. It'll be ice time. Be, It'll be literally ice time. I Driven offered, by content. I, a I, reached a nice out to, to I reached out to the Bidding and Sell podcast and I was like, look, I'm going to make an offer for Ike. You know, what's what's the buyout clause? Benny here? tried to Peter Vermees us <laughs> yeah, and be and like, Benny, we're going to need 500 yeah, million. Yeah. Uh-huh, <laughs> Benny, and then Benny goes and gets him on the on the like picture just to make Ike happy. So it's Ike. I think he's in the conversation because the defensive 100%. turnaround for Minnesota United, unreal. Massive. And they still put him out on an island. Not just him, Boxall too. But I think Ike, in my opinion, the more important of the two. Yeah. They put him on an island all the time and say, you know what, 1v1, figure this out. And he's done it. So who else is a candidate here? Miles what, Robinson what, has to be on the One list. person that's not talked about is Eddie Segura. Yeah, that's mm. fair. So he's, is that he's a played in 20, 20, He's played in 24 games, 23 starts. Yeah. He's got the most minutes on that back line. He's been the one consistent starting center back for that squad. R- reads the plays well. Is tough on the tackle. Everyone can depend on him. He's consistent. I love watching Eddie Segura and Zimmerman's similar mm-hmm. when the fullbacks go up and he gets pulled wide and he can defend in space. Like I think no one else. Maybe Miles Robinson's up there, but like he is. You put him on a half field by himself, one v one, and he's going to win that battle. There are few MLS players that do that. So you know, Ike wants that Tam deal. Defender of the year would be very helpful in that sense, and maybe he's going to get some help here because maybe Segura and Zimmerman. Split the vote for LAFC. Yeah, yeah 100%. maybe Miles Robinson and like an LGP. LGP is split not, that vote. LGP can't be okay. <laughs> All right. Miles Robinson has been the best defender in Atlanta United, and they have a thirty goals against sure. average. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- they've given up thirty goals. So NYCFC, they have one of the better defensive and, records in the league. So I'd say Maxime Cheneau should be. on But there. Maxime Cheneau and Anton Tinnerholm might split a little bit of that vote. Like I don't see, I don't see anybody that everyone's going to rally around in Ike's year when he won it. Everybody rallied around him, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah, that's often how these sort of awards go. Yeah, but shouldn't it technically go to the best team that's given up the least amount of goals? No, because if your team structure, so let's be real, what Ike is dealing with, and he's the, it's a much improved team. Ozzy Alonso in front of him, Jan Gregis, and, is harder and than Ro- what Ramon Mentaner. Yeah, yeah, but it's harder than what Miles Robinson, I think, is dealing with. Now, Miles Robinson is is influential to it's, what his team does, but he has more talent in a better structure around him. Isn't it I just think. is it harder or is it just different? Because like Miles Robinson had to beat out Florentine Pogba, who I think would have assumed that this was going to be his job. Young player with more expectations in Atlanta, with more eyeballs on him, comes in and performs. Whereas Ike, Ike's like, I know I'm good. Yeah, I know but I Pogba was hurt when the season started. Okay. That's why Miles. Was, but he had to my, hold on. But to he it. still. Bro- Beat out Michael Parkhurst as well. That's true. Yeah. And Laurentowitz, who's played center back. So he's he's beat out players, but he's been the one constant in that back line as well for Atlanta. And when you talk about athleticism, always been there. Yeah. But now the ideas of where should I be? How do I cover his ability to, to pass now? Like he can see passes. He can make those passes. He's comfortable on the ball. He can take touches. I think when you saw him before – he get on the ball. It's nervous. You you see nerves, and and you know it's you can't get can't get uh, can't wait to get the ball off his feet. Now it's calm. I can I can make the passes. I can make the right decision. Give me the ball, and I'll I'll start the attack. That's what you see from Miles Robinson. So also I can't wait to see him get the the call up to yeah. the U.S. Men's National Team in January camp. That's got to be a given. I can't wait to see these PR directors <laughs> the rest of the way trying to figure out a way to get their guy all the shine and defender of the year, goalkeeper of the year, new co- all these things. That's the way it works. This is the time. You know my address. Send all the gifts this way. So we never talk about fullbacks. You mentioned Tinner Home, which I think is I a know. fair mention in terms of the ones up like there. Kamar was hurt for a good yeah. part of the season. Mentaner and Juan are two of the better ones. Juan is one that I think is, is not, not getting the shine. But they're both attacking players. I That's feel like gonna LAFC say. is going to run away with all of these awards. And they, like I can't, and I can't, should. and they should. Be, yeah. And Walker Zimmerman is the sexy pick, but he deserves it. You know, I mean, they've. But it, it comes well, down to the MVP conversation, sure. right? Best versus most valuable, and no one has a, no one has an answer to the Defender of yeah. the Year one, which is what you were saying, which comes down to the LAFC one, which is right. Zimmerman probably deserves it. So LAFC probably Segura deserves or it. Zimmerman. 
But if it's I would for this year right now, I would pick Segura as well. Yeah, I would pick Segura out of the two. Even though I think Zimmerman is fantastic yeah. and he's been great for them, Segura has... He missed for Gold Cup. Right, right. there's, there's 24, 23 games he started. All right, yeah. be the voters, listeners. 401-206-0MLS. <laughs> Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Hit us with your defender of the year. Who would you go with? Let's revisit. Alistair Brewer hit us up last week and said... Wait, say, first our producer Anders picked Chad Marsh. Yeah, I know, and, <laughs> and that's why I went to Alistair <laughs> Brewer. Oh, sorry. Here. Yeah, because... The Chad Marshall theorem in reverse is going on right now, apparently, in Seattle. They lose 3-0 to RSL midweek. we got to get to MLS for the Lou because unofficially official, it seems like reports saying St. Louis dispatch that they will be the next team in Major League Soccer. St. Louis, cool. um, what is going on with the Sounders? What is your quick take here on the state of the Sounders? Uh, okay, so if, if mm. it was me, I wouldn't be super panicked because I think – Kim Kihi, I think, is a very good center back in Major League Soccer. And with Chad Marshall getting her and then going out, didn't have a solid partnership to play alongside. And then I think lost a little bit of confidence as Ariaga finally got there. And now you've got a guy who's trying to adjust to the league, maybe next to a guy who's not playing at his top form. So I would say if you're a Sounders fan, wait a little bit to see how that partnership comes together. And I thought it was promising to see Brian Schmetzer go with the five-man back line midweek obviously because it was midweek, just to show that maybe there is a little creativity in the thinking that if this doesn't come together the way we want it to in 2019, we have a backup plan of a way to go. So you abandoned that then but man, this, this with is a 3-0 a... loss. No, because uh, Kim Kihi didn't play in that game. Like It but wasn't it... your best talent out there. Kev... I get, I get the but why would you goals, change that didn't... all up midseason right now? It didn't look like they because were. Because they've gonna... been shipping goals poorly. I don't poorly. think they had a shot on target in this game. Like It's not just the defense at this point. Anyway, we're going to see on Saturday. Galaxy hosts Seattle. Galaxy had a nice win midweek against Dallas. 10 p.m. Eastern. That one is on ESPN2. MLS for the Lou. It looks like it is uh, going to go through. Kind of seemed that way. Commissioner Don Garber was saying at All-Star break that he was extremely impressed by their bid. Now the St. Louis Post-Dispatch is reporting that there will be an announcement next week in St. Louis announcing St. Louis as team number 28 in Major League Soccer. In case you've somehow forgotten, in 2020, Inter Miami and Nashville SC will enter 2021, Austin FC, and then you would expect 2022. Obviously, none of this is official. We're just kind of extrapolating from the report from the Post-Dispatch. That's when St. Louis would enter Major League Soccer. You can find me in St. Louis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Big, yeah. yeah. Nelly, all up in there. <laughs> so I think we should – why didn't we all, like, should put, like, the Band-Aid under yeah. our eyes? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be there at the announcement and be like, hey. yeah, 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 yeah. Have you ever been to his bowling alley? Hot in. Have you ever been to his bowling alley? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been to Nelly's bowling alley? Just seen it. Yeah, Just it's MTV awesome. MTV Cribs. It's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the St. Louis Ownership Group, in case you didn't know, is spearheaded by Carolyn Kindle Betts. She's the president of Enterprise Holdings Foundation, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Uh, that's where it's at. Jim Cavanaugh, CEO of Wide World, uh, excuse me, Worldwide Technology. So it's a... Majority female ownership group. They've got a primarily privately funded downtown stadium. They have a really good bid, and it seems like it's going to go through. Now, Commissioner Don Garber also reportedly visited Charlotte and Sacramento following the Board of Governors meetings at All-Star. He'd just gotten back from Las Vegas. The other cities still kind of like in and around the mix here for expansion. Charlotte, Indianapolis, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Raleigh, San Diego, all of them were at All-Star as well. What do you think about St. Louis? Don't make me like St. Louis. <laughs> Why? Because I, I'm from Chicago I and I have an innate something. like just hatred for the city because of all the oh, and he's from Kansas City. all the, we'll the sports rivalries. We'll however, them for being Cardinals fans. However, thank you yeah, very much. Maybe. Thank you. However, um, I think this is really cool. Um, I think that there is actually like a rich history of soccer in in St. Louis. I Absolutely f- is. And, and this, if there was ever a city right now that like really like needed something. soccer, something. Well, the blue. To be fair, the Blues just uh, won Stanley uh, Cup. They 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 got that. I know. I did, that didn't feel good. That for one's my rugby. Eye. That did not feel good for me either. But I love I love I love the female ownership group. Yeah, I love I love that, I love that this is a, a city that has really really pushed for it. You can like the fans have been like so outspoken about bringing soccer to St. Louis. I think I think that there's going to be a huge a huge response for this, and so I, it makes me. It's hard for me to say, but like I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. I'm down for I'm, I'm down for soccer in to, St. Louis to go for the call up. I'm here for this as yeah. well. It's going to be an incredible rivalry with Kansas City, a very natural rivalry. Yeah. I think also with Chicago, who have been yeah. lacking that natural rivalry as well. I kind of got nerdy on this uh, earlier today because I was like, man, how does it work with 28 teams 
into this league and two we, conferences because it kind of it flips back and forth. Do you want to wait to get to that? I yeah. just want to bask a little bit more. Sure, bask. I mean, this is the soccer community in America. Like, this is the one we've been waiting for. Obviously, Taylor Swinton's from there and has spoke exponentially. That's the one negative. It's just yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's uh, a single negative. It's, it's, you know, Taylor's going to yeah. probably be a little bit unsufferable about um, this. One. But he's talked about it all the time, but the history of the 1950 World Cup, the communities, their statues. Um, what's also real exciting is the youth development in that area. St. Louis Scott Gallagher, which is connected to St. Louis FC, which is the current USL championship team that Jim Kavanaugh actually still owns or currently owns. Uh, they're one of the best academies in the country, and they've not been connected to a pro team that they can push through to the first division. Do so, you think, do you think Taylor's going to be sporting director? No, I don't think so. I don't I think, think you could he, get. I don't think you could get him out of Boston. Now. Yeah, he's too close to his golf course. Yeah. yeah, I think he likes it in the booth. But, a microphone. but a guy like Josh Sargent could have been yeah. a seventeen-year-old homegrown in MLS. There are a lot of players yeah. in that area, and the fan base comes out for USL Championship. They want the team, so it's going to be a hit when it hits the ground, and it's exciting. Now let's see where they yeah. play. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Well. That is a great question conference-wise. The downtown stadium is uh, in development here. So I just didn't feel like two conferences really worked anymore. I was about to say, we've got to be close to three conferences. <laughs> I was thinking maybe four because I broke it down here and I tried to like separate things out. So in 2020, of Inter-Miami and Nashville come in. Right now, we're 12-12. and 12. We're even as far as east and west. But when Inter-Miami comes in, they're obviously east. Yeah. And Nashville, I don't think you can put them in the west uh, because you, have, you yeah. they need to you be with to, Atlanta though. and yeah, Orlando an hour and, a half and Miami. They have to be there. So uh, to me... I, they got to put them both in the East and figure out the schedule probably there. Then Austin FC gets you back in the West. That evens it out a little bit. St. Louis, you put them in the West. So then when they're at Kansas City and it evens it out, but then they're not with Chicago and that's Can I a ask bummer. A question? Yeah. Does Chicago have to be an Eastern Conference sports city? Uh, no. I don't think so. It could be like let's say well, they let's, move them. Oh, let's say they just create a central no. division. Yeah. Sure. How about this? Okay, so We're used to, I got yeah. it for you right here. Look the West that. the West Division is gonna be Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, San Jose, LAFC, LA Galaxy, and RSL. And here is the unfortunately the numbers Colorado, go this RSL. way. Colorado is they're the logical one to split out into the central. Mm. Then it would be Colorado, Minnesota, Chicago, Sporting KC, St. Louis, Columbus, Cincinnati in the central. So each of these are 17 conferences for the 28. In the east, you can probably guess that. Montreal, Toronto, NYCFC, Red Bulls, D.C., Philly, New England. And then the south is Atlanta, Orlando, Miami, Nashville, Houston, Austin, and Dallas. You Dang. Have, yeah, it's, <laughs> that's, that's sexy. Yeah, I, I like it. I'm, like, I'm getting jacked up about this. Where are you going to play? I know, right? My 34 like, game season in 2020. 22 hey. home and away in your division is 12 games and then so then you have I think one game against every other opponent in the league minus one you're not going to get every team just because it's the numbers game mm -hmm. but you'll get one game against every other opponent except for one team which gets left out of your schedule and you could rotate that on and on and on how do you feel about that breakdown I feel okay yeah I don't I don't know why you couldn't the moon for it. I don't know why you couldn't go west central east because then you slide Colorado back to the west with RSL. Well, then the east is too. Then you're pulling people out of the east. Well, you throw you throw the Texas teams in central, and you can potentially move Montreal around. That's what I would say. What do you mean you can move Montreal? Nah. Around? Montreal is like nah. Montreal. East, sorry, east. Toronto. Toronto. Yeah, sorry. Toronto's east east. Nah. No, not you drive straight to Michigan maybe, from maybe there. Maybe I like this a lot. Yeah, this is there, better than Toronto's that. the no. Trillium <laughs> Cup. It's Columbus. <laughs> oh, get out of here with your Trillium. <laughs> you can't. You can't not play a team. Like you have to be able to play every single. Team. Well, it doesn't happen right now. Well, no, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does uh, happen. Crap. But you don't. <laughs> but you don't play everyone at home. Yes, but see, doesn't happen in doesn't happen in other sports. Yeah, this is the way it goes. That's the way it goes. Just one NFL, team. You're not playing every team. You'll, you'll switch it every year. So you'll get that special Easter egg mm. game every now and then. You'll be like, ah, Come this, on, this year guys. we don't get San Jose. I'm okay. not with it. Fine. Let us I know like what it. you think about St. Louis. Okay. About uh, my proposed four. Uh, I'm down. Know, maybe. I'll, I'll sit, put this on Twitter and you can have your say <laughs> on that one. Uh, do we have time for the mailbag here? Yeah, hit it hard. One question. What are we going to do? Hit it hard. Uh, Sounders ownership changed. Russell Wilson, Ciara, McLemore. Microsoft CEOs, others joined their ownership group, which was cool. Joe Roth, he's moving on, but they uh, got a bunch of local folks in that are really excited about it. So I want to ask this. Which local celebrity would you like to see become an MLS owner just for ish and gigs? I, can we – we were having this conversation Kanye before. Kanye West. And uh, Weeby was a genius. Because I was, I was like, I'm up. like, who would be good in Chicago? And then he's like, Kanye. And I was like, 
My literally yep. get that like, complete rebrand. Boom. Go downtown with Kanye. And then Kardashians you said in tow. The Adidas connection. Oh, your marketing. Yeezys for everybody. Your marketing what? out of this world. If people didn't know about the fire before, they marketing know about the fire oh now. Oh my lord. Genius has been used twice today on this set. Both were incorrect. Okay. One was for Kanye, you? one was going? for What are you going with? What's your celebrity? It would be Lizzo with Minnesota United. Let's go. Whoa. I got you. Whoa. I like it. Yeah. I dig that. Because I love you. Oh, Wait, who? Nope. Step off. Step off. Let him finish that. All right. No, that was all I had. Oh, okay. okay, yeah. Sorry. That's yeah. the yeah. song. Uh, I think, you know, Joel Embiid is one that people have talked about for the Philadelphia Union. He could he, be really he, fun. He, he went lives to a in lot New of York, Union though. Games. You know does he, he lives in New York. Does he, he does? Play? Yeah, he lives in New York. Wow. Wow. So he couldn't be a Philly. Dude, couldn't we just dropped him. NBA news on know. extra time. Hey, 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 hey. Uh, Kansas City fans, I bet, would like Pat Mahomes. To, he's at a lot he of the games. That'd stands. be cool. He's cool. But we have 30 seconds here, so we're out of time for this one. You have to tell us what. Like local celebrity, just other celebrity, whatever it might be. You know, if it's like John Bon Jovi for the Red Bulls, I don't know what it no. is. Nah. He would no? be Philly. He would be Philly? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, my bad, John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Apologies. 401 206 0 MLS, extra time at MLSsoccer.com. We have some more good mail that we will get to on Monday. Enjoy your MLS weekend, ESPN Plus, ESPN, FS1. That's where that is. Uh, Match Day Central which Susanna is hosting, is on Woo! Sunday, I believe at 10.15. I'm yeah. in Portland. Say hello to me. With that, we're out of here. Enjoy your weekend, everybody.